I want to invite you to open your Bibles with me to the book of Ephesians, and we'll be back in chapter number 6 this morning. And we are jumping in this morning to looking at the various pieces of the armor that God has uh, equipped us with. Our responsibility in the fight of faith is to make sure that we put on each of these uh, pieces of artillery, if you will. And so we're going to spend the next several weeks together probably taking uh, each individual piece of the armor and looking at it and seeing its relevancy in our lives as we continue to fight the good fight of faith and lay hold on eternal life. And so we're going to go ahead and jump right in the middle of this thing this morning. All right, Ephesians chapter number 6. We've looked at all the verses several weeks now and uh, noticing that we are, verse number 10, uh, to be strong in the Lord, in the power of His might, verse number 11, as well as verse number 13, we're to put on the whole armor of God. Verse number 13 says it like this, that we're take unto ourselves the whole armor of God. Back in verse number 11, it serves the purpose that we stand against the wiles of the devil. And Paul gives the reasoning why such artillery, why such equipment is necessary because we're not fighting a physical warfare. The weapons of our warfare, Paul would say to the church of Corinth, are not carnal. They're mighty through God to the pulling down of, and he gives a lot of spiritual statements, to the pulling down of strongholds, the casting down of imaginations, every thought that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Verse number 12, the reasoning is we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but we do wrestle against principalities. We wrestle against powers. We wrestle against the rulers of the darkness of this world, and we wrestle against spiritual wickedness in high places. In verse 13, the reasoning for us taking this whole armor and putting it on to ourselves, a different reasoning is given much kind of similar to the wording of verse number 11, but a little distinct from it, that we may be able to withstand in the evil day, give an opposition to those things that are going on in our world that the child of God should be opposed to. And I remind us this morning that as believers, there are plenty of things that you and I should be opposed to in the secular world that we live in. In fact, the Bible's pronouncement of judgment is upon those uh, when, or, or upon those whom everybody speaks well of. Woe unto you when all men speak well of you. The idea there is that you're going along and have a lot in common with a generation that is bent against the things of God. And so why would we be embraced by them? By the way, we live in the same world system, part of the same world system that chopped the head of John the Baptist off and crucified the Lord Jesus Christ on the cross. And Jesus said that if they've hated me, they'll hate you also. And so we're living in very hostile uh, terms uh, in light of those sorts of realities. Then we come to our text verse, of course, this morning, in verse number 14, where Paul writes that we are to stand therefore. Notice the repetition of the idea of standing, not giving up ground. In fact, the, the military version of stand is onward, Christian soldiers. It's to, it's to press forward. It's to, it's to run with patience. It's to, it's to gain ground, not just stand your ground, but, but stand in the sense of, of covering ground, of, of setting up a good, strong defense as well as an offense. And then so Paul says, stand therefore, having your loins girt about uh, with truth. Stand Therefore, in light of everything that I've said, beginning really back inside of verse number 10, uh, Paul says, in light of that, because of the warfare, because of the principalities and the powers and the rulers of the darkness of this world and the spiritual wickedness in heavenly places, in high places, stand therefore having your loins girt about with truth. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Father, thank you for the privilege of being here inside of this service. And I pray, God, that you'd be pleased to meet with us and to so help us in this service for, for your entire glory's sake. God, we, we pray that no applause would be given to man, that, that we wouldn't look to the realm of, uh, 
of physical things, but, but may we lift our eyes and look towards the heavens from where our help comes. Help us this morning in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And so this morning, if we had to define uh, in, in very simplistic terms for us, now, which part of the equipment of the armor of God that Paul is addressing in verse number 14, we would simply call it the belt of truth. And I think that uh, be made sen- uh, it will make more sense to us as, as it progresses if it doesn't right off the bat. And so as Paul is working his way through uh, here the context of spiritual warfare, he is depicting the Christian as an armed soldier who is now preparing himself for the battle. And uh, every good soldier is going to have certain pieces of equipment which are absolutely necessary if he's going to be successful in the battle. As I was uh, earlier this week going over and preparing the message for this Lord's Day, uh, as I was just kind of right right here where we're talking about at now, uh, I immediately thought about my son. My son, uh, Andrew loves to play a, uh, a hunting game on the PS4. Please don't crucify me if you don't allow your children to have video games or anything like that. It's the only way I can get peace and quiet in our home for me and my wife. And so uh, he gets to play that, and and he's got this uh, this this game, this hunting game. And uh, before he goes out on the track to to go hunting, whatever it is he's gonna he's gonna hunt, he gets to load up a certain amount of equipment in this virtual reality sort of world. And so he gets to pick and choose, you know, a, a stand or this or that or whatever the case is. And uh, inevitably, there's a, there's some luxuries you could call it. There's some accessories that you could or could do without, could or could not do without. But there's some pretty vital things as you're getting ready to go out. You know, when, when I grew up, you just went out and took a, took a gun in the woods. You just shot whatever was moving. Now, now the kids learn how to hunt, you know, on video games, so, which is, which is cool because it's probably a little dangerous what we were able to do when we were growing up. Uh, but, uh, you know, if he's going to be successful, there's some things that you just got to have. And we know that in a real world context, right? Uh, going out if you're hunting or fishing, you know, some accessories, you know, a thermosail. Uh, now, I, I don't know if you call that a necessity or, or, a, or a, just an accessory, not kind of non-essential. If, if you get attacked by mosquitoes on a regular basis, you probably want the thermosail, uh, like Dylan. Dylan looks like he has chicken pox if he doesn't have something like that when we go camping and, and things. And so the idea is what's essential and what isn't essential? What, what can I take? Or what, rather, what do I have to take to make sure I'm successful in what I'm about to go out and do. For the Roman soldier, it's much of the same kind of concept what you and I are used to whenever we're going out to do things like that. Uh, he, he has to think to himself, what can I not live without? Literally, what am I going to die? Uh, uh, what, am I, what am I going to die from if I don't take certain things with me? And so on, on the top of the list, for the soldier, one of the first items, one of the first pieces of equipment that he's got to make sure that he has is the belt, something to gird up his loins, if you will. And so, so when a Roman soldier was preparing himself for the battle, he made sure that he had his leather belt and, and that that leather belt uh, was securely fastened around him. And, and what, what this belt of sorts is going to accomplish is, is going to allow him to take his, uh, uh, his tunic, his, his overlay, his shirt, if you will, and to make sure that it's tucked good and tight into this, into this belt to make sure that nothing is loose or, or dangling around. And this is really important because for the soldier, if he has his, his garments, that are, that are just loose and flapping around in the wind and all those kinds of things. It, it's going to be a hindrance to him, and it's also going to become very dangerous for him. A hindrance in the sense that if he, got, if he has a lot of loose articles on as he's reaching for his sword, his spear, or whatever it is, he could get caught up in the looseness of the garment and not be as efficient in the battle as he might otherwise be. Or as he's engaged in the battle, it become very dangerous to have those loose items kind of flailing around uh, him uh, because his enemy could take advantage of those loose articles and grabbing him and turning him around and things of that nature. And, and so the belt really, what we, we could say, is what held it all together. I guess we could kind of say it like that. It gave a tight fit uh, to him. The belt is what Paul was alluding to in verse number 14 because it literally girded his loins 
together. It, it made sure everything was in its place. It gave a tight fit and therefore presented the ability to fight well as a Roman soldier. Well, good belts didn't just serve in this day 2,000 years ago across the ocean. Uh, soldiers, Roman soldiers, a good belt also served ordinary citizens of the uh, of Middle Eastern territory here. Uh, in fact, for the normal average citizen, when they got in a hurry, uh, they, they didn't dress the way we dress. When they, they went to church, they didn't put on suits and ties and uh, the ladies put on you know nice uh, dresses like you may maybe have on today. They would have an outer garment, especially the men, uh, a robe of sorts, and, and it would go all the way down to the ground. And so if, uh, if a gentleman got in a hurry and he needed to run somewhere, a lot of times... He would, he would kind of bunch up together that robe and he would tuck it into his belt, allowing him to run a little bit faster. And so, so a belt really helped out a lot of people in that society. In fact, again, while I was in my office this past week and I was thinking over the message and thinking about the, the purpose, the significance of a belt, the function of a belt, I thought about several folks in our modern society that I've seen walking on the streets that could benefit from a good belt uh, as well. And so uh, uh, just, just kind of observations there that you think about while you're in deep meditation and prayer over the Word of God. In simplicity this morning, the belt speaks of preparedness. It, it speaks about someone, whether or not they are prepared to do whatever activity, activity it is, that they need to accomplish in this, in this setting, in a, in the setting of a Roman soldier, uh, the, the belt, uh, was, was significant in this sense. If you didn't have the belt on, you weren't prepared. You just simply weren't prepared. The, uh, the sword, the shield, the helmet, anything else, none of that really mattered at the end of the day. You're still not going to be as efficient as you might otherwise be if you did not have on a belt, something uh, to kind of pull in uh, uh, your uh, your midsection and have things tightly fit to your body and able to move and maneuver. Well, this isn't a, a topic, a subject that is confined uh, to Paul's writings, especially to the church of Ephesus in Ephesians chapter number 6. In fact, the idea of having your loins girt about you to produce a sort of efficiency is a concept that goes all the way back, way into our Old Testaments. In fact, in Exodus chapter number 12, on the night of the Passover, uh, God gave instructions to the nation of Israel in the same way. Listen to what God says in Exodus chapter 12 and verse number 11. He says, And thus shall ye eat it, talking about the Passover meal. And thus shall ye eat it. Here's the first instruction to how to eat the supper. With your loins girded, your shoes on your feet, your staff in your hand, and ye shall eat it in haste. God was telling the nation of Israel, I need you to be efficient here. I need you to be prepared here. Uh, when you eat this meal, I need you ready to get out of Egypt. God knew the timetable. He knew it because He had established it. And He knew the children of Israel, the nation of the, of the Hebrews, needed to get out of there because Pharaoh is going to do what? One more time, he's going to change his mind and he's going to pursue them. And so God needs the Hebrew nation to get to a certain uh, rallying point uh, uh, in, in order for, for him to continue this great drama of redemption. And so in the instructions, God says to the nation of Israel, you need to have your loins girded, be prepared. Uh, likewise, uh, as you come over to the New Testament, to the gospel accounts, uh, Jesus is going to use this same uh, uh, the same concept in reference to being prepared for the second coming, for His soon arrival uh, back to establish His kingdom on earth. In Luke chapter 12 and verse 35, Jesus tells His disciples and subsequently us 2,000 years later, let your loins be girded about and your lights burning. What's Jesus saying? Well, he's using that as a, uh, as a comparison, an analogy of sorts. He, he simply said, you need to be prepared for my return. Don't be caught just, just dozing off. Don't, don't be caught just lounging around the house. You know, uh, uh, one of the things that, uh, 
I hope this isn't too vulgar for us today, but it, one of the things that you, that you might find later on this year, say, uh, around, uh, uh, around the, what is it, the third Thursday in the month of November, uh, which is Thanksgiving, right? If I don't have that right, don't tell me because that'd be embarrassing behind the pulpit. I just kind of glanced at my wife to see if she's like, mm, like that right there. Uh, so I think I'm good uh, on that. Uh, you, you may find a bunch of men, at least by mid-afternoon, kind of at least loosening uh, their belt, if not just kind of throwing the belt in the trash can altogether because they're getting comfortable. They're not prepared to battle. You know that, don't you, ladies? They're prepared to go to sleep is all they're uh, prepared to do around my house. They want to go outside and play football. The kids do after that. I'm not prepared to go out and play football after Thanksgiving meal. I'm prepared to go into a self-induced coma. Uh, you know, when you're just lounging around and you're being lazy, you don't want something tight fitting around you. But but the idea of what Christ is saying is we're not lounging around. We're not just dozing off. We're not just in a in a comatose state here. But but the idea is be prepared, be, be ready. For the coming of the Lord. Likewise, uh, Peter, just in addressing normal, everyday, honest Christian living, makes this statement in 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse number 13. Wherefore, Peter says, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Peter says to span the time from your conversion to the time that you see the Lord Jesus Christ. Keep your loins girded up around you. Be prepared every day of your life to live victoriously for the Lord Himself. Now, what is it then that becomes this belt? What is it that prepares the believer for battle? That, that holds everything close to his person and makes him more efficient in the spiritual warfare that we're engaged in? Well, Paul says it's one thing, and it's called truth. Truth is the belt of the Christian. It is what prepares us for the battle. Uh, you can have the Bible itself, the Word of God, the sword of the Spirit. You can have the helmet, a testimony of salvation. You can have a breastplate of righteousness and attempt to live good and honest before the Lord and before men. But if you don't have a good grip on truth, then everything else becomes uh, uh, becomes insignificant and virtually ineffective because we must have truth. Truth is literally, in Ephesians 6, what holds it all together, isn't it? Uh, so we have to have truth. Aletheia in the Greek. Now the word itself means the content of that which is true. Uh, it also refers to the attitude towards truthfulness. It's not just having truth because all of us don't have all truth. In fact, none of us have all truth. But but the idea becomes, once our attitude towards truth, uh, hopefully you and I will spend the rest of our lives seeking after truth, wanting to acquire more truth, more knowledge, wisdom, discernment, understanding, whatever word you want to kind of insert in for that. that. That's the pursuit of our lives, right? To, to get more knowledge to get more understanding. And so as we're, as we're pursuing that knowledge, as we're wanting that knowledge, as that knowledge is being presented to us, the question becomes, what's your attitude towards it? Are you going to bow up at truth? Uh, just because somebody has the guts to tell you what you won't tell yourself? Or are you going to, are you going to get a bad attitude and walk away from the truth? Or are you going to ignore the truth? Are you going to build up a wall around yourself and say, well, I'm just not going to let the truth in? And by the way, you have the will, you have the freedom to be able to do that if you want to. It would be very stupid for you to do that, but you have the ability to build up to resist the truth of God's word, to resist truth in and of itself. In fact, truth is the Word of God. It's the only objective, absolute uh, source that we have in this world. The Bible itself will never change. And therefore, Jesus says that it is the truth that will make you and I free. It's the only source that, that we have. And so, uh, again, what holds everything together? What, what prepares us for the battle? Well, well it's truth. It's, it's in a specific tone. It's our attitude towards truthfulness. Um, in, in the analogy 
that, that Paul is here kind of unveiling for us. Uh, hypocrisy, deceit, uh, lies are not only potential hindrances to the believer, they can become very dangerous. Just like the tunic, just like the outer layer garment for the soldier can hinder him and can become very dangerous and actually used by the enemy against him, so too can hypocrisy, can deceitfulness, can outright lies uh, not only hinder our efficiency, but it can become very dangerous being used by the enemy. Listen to me, not to, not to cut you on the arm, not to, not to bruise you on the leg, but to destroy you. You, you understand again in Paul's analogy here, he's not talking about a uh, I'm going to go ahead and do it for you, for your own benefit. He's not talking about a WWE match here. He's not talking about something you walk away from. All right, the wrestling match that that Paul has in mind is something that takes place in a coliseum where the where the winner lives and the loser dies. It's that vital to 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 our uh, to to the reality that that you and I need to make sure that we have our loins girt about us the the belt of truth placed on and so and so hypocrisy deceit lies are things that that need to be tucked in to the belt of truth they should not be allowed to just flail around that they shouldn't be allowed to just flap freely and loosely and carelessly as we go through our lives, we should be very careful to retract those things and to and to place them under the belt of of truth. Now, if you want more of a, I guess, a biblical uh, exposition on all of that, listen to what Paul says to Timothy later on, Second Timothy. In uh, chapter 2, verses 3 and 4, listen to how Paul words this same exact concept. He says, Thou, therefore, talking to Timothy, endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No man, he says, that warreth entangleth. There's an operative word. No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. The word entangle there means to entwine, to get caught up in. The idea, Paul says, is that a good soldier is a man that has the affairs that belong to him tucked in very neatly, very tightly to his body, so he's not getting caught up in everything else that's going on in his life. Listen, we live in an entirely distracted society. Do we not? I mean, I can labor to preach. It doesn't matter, honestly. We make a lot of jokes. It doesn't matter if I preach 15 minutes or if I preach an hour. About five minutes into this thing, most people's minds are completely distracted by wishing they were doing something else or thinking that they'd rather be doing something else than what they're doing here. We, we have a disregard for truth. Uh, we ignore what's presented to us. We think we know what's best. We're, we're too busy thinking over this week's grocery list or this week's chores list or cleaning cuticles out or or uh, making notes down on a piece of paper. Some folks, even when they're taking notes about the Bible, are more interested about the notes that they're taking about the Bible than what the Bible itself is saying. We're completely distracted. Uh, listen, uh, put it in to, to Paul's perspective here. Uh, we're going to war. Not, not next year. Not next month, not next week, but today. Today we fight. And, and we sit casually by like, 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 like there's nothing for us to do. Paul said, get the belt. Get the belt and put it on. Don't get entangled with the affairs of this life. Don't get caught up in Facebook and, and all of that other stuff. Don't, don't, don't get caught up in peer pressure and, and social influences and things of that nature. Get the truth and put it on. So, which brings us to the, to the larger question at hand this morning, where we want to spend the majority of our time. How do we put on the belt? How, how do we appropriate truth? How, how do we literally take truth and, and put it in our lives in a way that it'll hold everything else together? I'll give you three things this morning and, and we'll be finished. No, number one, all right? You hold on real tight here, all right? Uh, <laughs> uh, which is an appropriate uh, statement to make in light of using the belt of truth, right? Uh, so, number one, if you're taking notes, write down, I want you to jot down, promote the truth. 
there, there's, there's the first way that we're going to put on the truth, all right? Is to promote the truth. Now, I, I, this honestly should be able to go without saying, but I'm a preacher and I get paid to say things, and so I got to say it anyway, right? No, no, honestly, this should be able to go without saying, but, but honestly, you and I live in a society that is built on being deceitful. Um, uh, uh, the folks seemingly that get ahead in life are those that know how to tell lies. In, in fact, morality is almost entirely a thing uh, of the past as far as good biblical morality because at the end of the day, I can do whatever it is I want to do and just tell a lie to cover it up. That's just kind of the way we, where we live at, isn't it? I mean, I mean, children are, are raised now in an age to where they become some of the best hypocrites and best deceivers that, that I think American soil has ever seen. It seems like their conscience is seared. They, 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 uh, uh, it's not like they're upset. Uh, a lot, and talking generally here, please don't get upset because you think I'm talking about your child. I may be talking about your child, but I haven't called their name yet. And so, uh, we can all smile and get along good here today. Probably talking about my children, uh, to be honest with you, all right? But, but they are. They, they can be hypocrites. They can, they can lie and not feel any kind of disregard, any, any kind of bad feelings about it and just come up with one lie after after another to cover it up. That should never, that should never be associated with a believer. Absolutely never. That should never be the case for the child of God. In fact, Paul said to the church at Colossae like this, Colossians chapter 3, verse number 9, lie not one to another. Should that be enough? I mean, should that be enough? we shouldn't have to go any further than that. Hey, stop lying. Stop, stop being deceitful. Stop playing the part of a hypocrite. Lying entails so much more than what's coming out of your mouth. You can lie by your behavior. You're a liar when you're one thing at church and you're another thing at work or school. You're a liar. You're, you're a deceptive person. And, and, and remember this, that no liar inherits the kingdom of God. Uh, no person that that is the integral part of your life uh, is, is an authentic, genuine believer. And so Paul says, lie not one to another. You may need a newer version of the Bible to understand that, but to me, it's pretty, pretty evident what, 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 what Paul's actually saying there. But he doesn't stop there. And so he says, lie not one to another, comma, seeing you have put off the old man with his deeds. Um, without doing injustice to the scriptures, let me just, I'm going to do what James Vernon McGee always did in his commentaries. He always just paraphrased it. And he made sure that he knew this wasn't a translation of the Bible. But he paraphrased it just to, just to bring it into modern terms. James Vernon McGee is now uh, outdated. He was the famous Presbyterian preacher of a generation ago that threw the Bible. If you listen to 92.5, he comes on lunchtime, got that old raspy voice. And, uh, and so his, uh, his paraphrases are now outdated. So I'm going to give you one for me and we'll just see how, how it goes over here. And, and you look it up later on in class. Colossians 3 9. Here's, here's all Paul said. Don't lie because you say you're saved. That's all he's saying. You say that you're a child of God. You claim to have put off the old man with his deeds. You're just claiming to be saved. And because you say that you're a Christian, lying should never be a possibility for us. Lying is obviously therefore wrong. Uh, any sort, any, any vein of uh, de deception is obviously wrong, is obviously wrong because it is expressly forbidden by Scripture. And so it should be avoided for that reason and that reason alone. But I'm going to go a step further with you this morning, all right? Uh, that, and and that's, the, that's the main thing, right? If you get that and you live by that creed, then you have done exactly what you need to do as a believer. But, but lying shouldn't, doesn't have to be, let me say it that way, lying doesn't have to be avoided only because God uh, forbids it, which is, again, completely efficient, completely sufficient, completely right uh, to do. Should be absolutely enough, but it should also be avoided because of what it does to the individual that's lying. Did you know, did you know that telling lies produces or it should produce a guilty conscience for an individual? And I say it should because if you can tell lies and not have a guilty conscience, a, an, a, an accused conscience, then you've got bigger problems than telling lies. You've got major problems. Um, the, the person that is deceptive uh, 
in his behaviors should, should have associated with that a guilty conscience. And why would anybody want a guilty conscience? Why would anybody want to, want to have to second guess everything that's going on in their life wondering, does, does, has so and so found out that I lied to him yet? Why would anybody want to live that sort of life? And listen, that's exactly how it happens. And you know that's exactly how it happens. When you tell lies, you always have to wonder, are they going to come back and bite me? Right? You always have to wonder. I, we can illustrate that in the Scripture. You don't have to get very far into your Bible in the book of Genesis. In fact, as the book of Genesis is, is, is kind of to its midway, a little bit past the midway point, you have a story about a, about a man who has several sons. And there's one son among the several sons that's his favorite son. And that son's name was what? Joseph. You remember him? He has the coat of many colors. It's obvious that his father likes him more. And, and Joseph doesn't help his situation, does he? does he? I mean, he has these dreams about him being more important than everybody else. And he just tells them to everybody and rubs it in everybody's face. And and uh, in that sense, Joseph may have been a little bit of a bread kid. Nobody wants to hear that kind of stuff. And so, uh, but but anyway, you've got all of that kind of, uh, you know, going on. Or there comes a day uh, where Joseph is going to check on the brothers. You know the story well, uh, how everything unfolds. Uh, long story short, they eventually take Joseph and they now sell him into slavery, more or less. Well, the other sons come back and what do they do to Jacob, their father? Do they tell him the truth? Well, no, they, they lied to him. They, 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 they bring back the coat of many colors. They've, they've put blood from an animal all over it. And, uh, and they say, can you tell if this is Joseph's coat or not? And, and Jacob sees and he says, of course, that's Joseph. And he's crying. He's weeping. And he assumes that a wild animal has killed his favorite son. Well, fast forward years, years into, into the future. And finally, Joseph is reunited with his, with his brothers. But, but before the brothers know that who Joseph is, uh, when, when things start going south in that reuniting process and, and, and some things happen that they're not really comfortable with, they immediately, you read it on the pages of scripture, of scripture, they immediately say, well, all of this bad stuff's happening to, happening to us because we told a lie about our brother so many years ago. Immediately, they never got over it. For X number of years, every night, when they pillowed their head down at night, they thought, when is that lie going to come back and bite me? You, you can find another illustration of that when you come over into the, into the New Testament. There's a man by the name of Herod. And uh, Herod has somewhat of an interest. We're not sure what kind of an interest it was. But it has somewhat of an interest in the preaching of John the Baptist. Why he does is beyond me. Maybe just like the uh, the enthusiasm, uh, maybe the charisma, maybe just something new kind of going on. But but he's but he's going and he's hearing him. And uh, John the Baptist is going to tell Herod, it's not lawful for you to have your mother's wife, your brother's wife. And and so he's going to preach against adultery and, and a whole lot of things are going to go on again. Long story short, John the Baptist uh, through a series of events is going to have uh, the head of John the Baptist cut off. He's going to have him executed, killed. And, and so sometime later, just, just a little while later, he begins hearing about the fame of Jesus Christ. And you know immediately what Herod thinks about the situation? You know immediately what he thinks about? He thinks, uh, man, that's, uh, that's John the Baptist risen from the dead. Well, it's crazy, isn't it? It's crazy. But living the sort of lifestyle, the deceptive, hypocritical lifestyle that Herod was attempting to live during that day, it produced that kind of a guilty conscience. When he saw a man that reminded him of John the Baptist, he comes up with a far-fetched notion that maybe John the Baptist is risen from the dead and has come back and he gets scared again inside of his life. Listen, uh, if we're going to put the belt of truth on, here's, here's where we got to start at. Let's just be promoters of the truth. Let's put the truth on. Let's speak the truth. Let's live the truth. Let's be honest. Let's be the same thing tomorrow morning that we were this morning. Let's just be promoters of the truth. Here, here's the second thing. You jot it down. Uh, discover the truth. Here's another way. Another way that we can put on the belt of truth. We can, we can uh, promote the truth. And then secondly, we can discover the truth. What, what do I mean by discover the truth? Well, you can find it out. You can discover the truth. Um, don't just believe 
what everybody is telling you to believe. Find it out. And by, by the way, you, you've always got to ask yourself this question. The people that I'm allowing to influence me in my life, are they honest people or are they deceptive people? Because one of the most ridiculous things that I could ever allow to happen to me is to allow deceptive people to be the people that are influencing my life. Which is why Solomon said uh, to his son, my son, when sinners entice you, don't consent, don't give in to them. Because they're the wrong kinds of people. Don't, don't allow the wrong kinds of people to be the influencers of your life. It's not going to go well. John, the beloved, said in his third epistle, third John, in verse number four, listen to what John says. He says, I have no greater joy. John's writing as a pastor from a pastoral point of view. And he says, I have no greater joy. Not, not Winning Publishers Clearing House isn't better than this. Somebody giving me a beach house. Somebody, somebody, somebody giving me a million bucks. Some, somebody, I mean, I mean, there's not a, there's not any other thing. No other report in this world that tops this. John says, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in the truth. All right. So, so truth again, isn't so much what's coming out of my mouth. It's the pattern of my lifestyle. And John says, you can walk in the truth. You can live out the truth in your life. And John, again, from a pastoral point of view, says that's the best news that I could hear ever hear about, to hear that one of my church members got a hold of it this Sunday. I mean, they listened to the preaching. They made the, they made the commitment out there at the service, and they went home, and they put what they heard into practice. John said, that lights my fire, man. I love to hear that. So, so, so the idea is find it out. Discover what the truth is. Launch an investigation. Do your own homework. Find out what is truth and get a hold of it. And now you and I periodically talk about the nobility of the Berean Christians. When we talk about the Berean believers being more noble, why do we call them more noble? You know, it's because they search the Scriptures, right? In fact, the Bible tells us in Acts chapter 17, that the Bereans were more noble and it compares them to another group of people. It's like comparing churches. Like me saying, the, the Fellowship Baptist Church is better than, and I could maybe say a few names there, but I'm not going to, all right? Uh, uh, the Fellowship Baptist Church is better than such and such Baptist Church. And not just, not just flubbing smoke around, but, but having some kind of real reason why you could say that. And so Luke says, the believers, this is the report of the day, that the believers in Berea were more noble than the ones that were in Thessalonica. And here's the reason why that church is better than that church. He says because they searched the Scriptures to see whether those things were so. Is what the preacher's preaching about, is it really truth? Now, the majority of people in our day and age uh, don't know that. Uh, and it's not because they launch an investigation. It's simply because they hear something that they don't like and so they dismiss it at error. Yeah. The Bereans didn't do that. The Bereans said, you know what, if that's truth, I need to know it so I can really put that inside of my life. I don't want to just believe something or dismiss something because of its comfort level to me or its level of uncomfortability to me. I want to know what the truth is so I can put it in my life. In short, what were the Christians in Berea doing? Well, they were just discovering truth. What is truth? They, they heard something that sounded good perhaps to them, or they heard something that sounded bad to them. But it didn't matter how they felt about it. They didn't live. Jot that down, maybe in your notes. They, they, they didn't live based on feeling. There would be a revival of the Christian church in America in the 21st century if we would all make that sort of decision today. They didn't live their lives based on feeling. It didn't matter if they felt good about it or they felt bad about it. They went home and they searched the Scriptures to see if what that man said was right. And if it was right, they said, then I'm going to put it in practice in my own life. And so they got home, they checked it out. Now, ironically, later on, Paul is going to have to deal with that very subject for the church at Thessalonica. What they were rebuked for indirectly in the book of Acts, Paul's going to have to rebuke them directly in his first epistle that he writes to him. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 21, here's what Paul's going to say to him: Prove all things and hold fast to that which is good. 
Prove it. Prove it. Set out to discover it. Your mentality shouldn't be when Brother Mason teaches your Sunday school class or Brother Curtis teaches your Sunday school class or Brother Paul or whoever it is, Brother Tingen preaching night. Your attitude shouldn't be, I'm going to prove that man wrong. <laughs> it shouldn't be that. Okay, it should be, it should be, you know what, that's interesting. I'm going to do some homework and I'm going to find, if it's not so obvious in the Bible. Now some things you probably don't need to search out or, or you don't have to take the time to search out. But every once in a while, we're going to deal with some of those subjects. I, I, I preached a message some, some time ago on uh, the cultural distinctions of, of the genders. A, a very hot sorted subject for American uh, people living in the 21st century. And, and some folks... Here, here's what we did on both sides. The folks that, 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 that were kind of in line with what I was preaching out, they were like, yeah, boy, that's right, preacher. You tell them. Amen. I can see when y'all do that. And, uh, you know, sweet, you know, but, but then there's another group that they hadn't got on board with that yet. And they were like, nope, that's absolutely wrong. I don't believe that. Well, who was right? Who was wrong? I'll tell you what, both groups were wrong. Both groups are wrong. When you deal with a, with a, with a, a subject like that, let's, I, I, I tell you what's the deciding factor. The Bible. Take the Word of God, and let's search the Scriptures, all right? And let's, let's discover truth. By, by the way, in 1 Thessalonians 5, 21, the word prove means to test or to examine, all right? Let me give you this third one, and we'll be finished. I got one and a half minutes, and we're almost going to be there. Number three, welcome the truth. Welcome the truth. And so, and so we promote the truth, we discover the truth, and we welcome the truth. Here's the reality. First reality is we're not going to make it in a minute and a half, okay? The second reality, the second reality is that I can discover the truth for you. I can do that. In fact, in fact, uh, that's, that's kind of what my, my paycheck is every week to sit in my office and to study. And I have the privilege of unearthing and uh, discovering truth from the Word of God. I can do that and I can feed it to you. Again, that's Part of that weekly thing, isn't it? I stand here just like I'm doing this morning and what I have unearthed in my, in my office uh, through study and prayer, I'm feeding it to you. We call it revelation. Uh, it is the imparting of knowledge. And uh, in fact, the Bible tells us that the Bible calls people that do that teachers. And God gave some teachers to the church and He gave those teachers for that sole benefit of them unearthing the truths of God's Word and presenting it, feeding the truth of God's Word to you. And so in, in that sense, uh, you've got some help uh, along the way. It's not just you. You don't have to become a monk. You, you don't have to live in isolation. You don't have to quit your job necessarily and, and, and live exclusively inside of your bedroom just pouring over the Scriptures every day of your life. If God's called you to do that. Wonderful. But I'm guessing the majority of us that He hasn't done that. And so God has given to us a gift in the various teachers that He presents to the church. And so they discover truth and they feed you truth. This isn't a bad thing, all right? The question at that juncture is when the truth again is presented to us, what are we going to do with it? Are we going to welcome it into our life? Or are we going to dismiss it? And, and the operative word here from the verse I'm, I'm about to give you is to receive it. We should receive the truth, welcome the truth. Here's how James says it in James chapter 1 and verse number 21. He says, Receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your souls. Now, it seems like from the English language that James has kind of got the cart before the horse because he talks about receiving the word which is able to save your souls, which he, which he said, you know, uh, welcome the word of God in your life and later on it will be able to save you. But that's not the way James is intending it to necessarily sound for us. What, what James is saying is you can trust the word of God because of the past performances of the Word of God. The Word of God has been able to bring about salvation in your life. It's able to save a man's soul. And you and I know that by experience, don't we? It was through the preaching, the witness of the Word of God. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. And so maybe it was a personal soul winner. Maybe it was a preacher as it was with me 22 years ago, standing behind the pulpit and preaching the gospel. Maybe it was a Sunday school teacher. Maybe it was a friend or a co-worker. Somebody just a parent. Somebody shared the gospel with you, maybe repetitively. And, and you finally came to that point of repentance 
and placing your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so what James is saying is you remember the power that the Word of God brought into your life and what it was able to produce for you. And what James is saying is if the Word of God was able to produce salvation, the saving of your soul, what else do you think? It can do for you. The the idea is the argument from the greater to the lesser. If it can save your soul, which is the greater, it'd have no problem with all the smaller things of life, like how you should dress and what kind of music you should listen to and what kind of recreation you should involve yourself in and where you should be at on a Sunday night of your life and all of those other kind of issues. It can be, it can take care of those kinds of things. All right. We'll close this morning giving you an illustration. There's an illustration about two men that I want to give to you this morning, all right? And, uh, and these two men are part uh, of the same church. They're members of the same church. And here's how we're going to distinguish from the two men. There's one man that has an eye patch, and there's one man that doesn't have an eye patch. Okay, brother Mason's excited because I already told him this uh, this story earlier this week. He's really excited about eye patch man here. Okay, and so you have one man, one dude, we'll call him, uh, that wears an eye patch, and one man that doesn't wear an, an, an eye patch. The man that does not wear the eye patch. By, by the way, again, they're members of the same church. He comes to church pretty much every Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night of his life. He's pretty involved in the ministries. Of, of the church, but, but he always has kind of a skeptical point of view. He's never really enthusiastic necessarily about being at church, but, but, but it's not like he hates coming to church. He just, he comes because it's part of, of what he does. He's involved in the Sunday school class, but he's not extra involved in the Sunday school class. He leaves church and he's somewhat of what we would call a hypocrite. The man that doesn't wear an eye patch, he, he goes back out and he gets inside of his vehicle and he listens to music periodically that's severely questionable. We would call it worldly music. And, and he kind of just enjoys that kind of lifestyle. And the people that really count that are spiritual influencers in his life, they don't know about it. They're not riding in the vehicle. And so as far as man with no eye patch is concerned, it's kind of inconsequential. And, uh, and, and so he flubs in some other areas as well. His, uh, his, uh, convictions, his standards aren't quite up the board where the rest of the people of the church probably think that they are just because the image that's presented at church is so much different than the image that's actually upheld through the rest of his days. If you hear some dirty jokes, he kind of laughs at them. If the inappropriate, uh, shows come on television, he watches them and, and kind of just indulges and enjoys those kinds of things. And, and, and life though, for man that doesn't wear eye patch, is uh, is going pretty well, you know, in certain regards. He doesn't have any big calamities going on until one day in his life, and he gets a phone call, and something very traumatic has happened, and man with eye patches life begins to go downhill very quickly. He begins blaming God and blaming the church and blaming the pastor and blaming the circumstances. And the reason why this bad thing has happened is everybody else has fallen in the world and it doesn't take long and man with eye patches completely out of church, completely inoculated to the things of God, doesn't care about reading a Bible, doesn't care about living for the Lord any longer inside of his life. And, and, and to really give the kicker here, Man without eye patch eventually is going to die. He's going to stand before God in judgment. And although he made a flimsy profession when he was a little child inside of the church that he used to be a member of, he stands before God and he's found out that he was never a genuine convert and he's condemned to an eternity in hell. Man without eye patch thought he had a rough go of it for a little while in life, but that doesn't even begin to measure up with where he's headed to now, not for time, but for all eternity. The second story is about a man that was a member of that same church, man with an eye patch. Man with an eye patch is a little different sort of a character. He's faithful as well. Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night. The difference between man with eye patch versus man without eye patch is man with eye patch loves the preaching of the Word of God. He's not as vocal maybe as some of the other men inside of the church, but he's always taking notes. He's taking notes because he wants to hang on to every truth. And everything that, that seemingly is significant or, or important, he seems to just jot down because he wants to review it later on that week during his private devotional and, and prayer time. He loves the preacher. He loves the Sunday school teacher. He loves the ministries of the church. And he's always looking for a way that he can become more involved, whether that's cutting grass, cleaning a building, or teaching or singing, or whatever the case is, man with the eye patch just simply wants to be a blessing. His life is so much different, though, than the man without the eye patch. Because the man with the eye patch 
constantly has traumatic things happening to him. He has a rough go of life. Seems like he's always getting bad news. He doesn't have necessarily a lot of money. He doesn't have a lot of things going for him. And he probably doesn't have a lot of friends, if we were completely honest with you. One day, he has one phone call that takes place that really is the trauma of all traumas inside of his life. It's the worst news that you could ever imagine. But unlike the man without the eye patch, when he hears this news, he nestles up to God a little bit closer. And he prays and he fasts and he seeks counsel from his pastor and he begins more frequently coming down to the altar and praying and begging God to do something real and transcendent in his life because he realizes there's really no other help outside of the Lord inside of his life. Well, uh, he throughout the years after this trauma, trauma happens to him, draws closer and closer to the Lord and uh, and just serves in great capacities inside the local church, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Well, as time and fate would happen to all men, man with eye patch dies as well, stands before God in judgment, and hears these words one day, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. Now, maybe, I hope, you're sitting there thinking, man, that story sounds very, very familiar. I hope you're thinking that. Because without the eye patch scenario, that's the exact story that Jesus concluded the Sermon on the Mount with in Matthew chapter 7. There's a man, two men, Jesus says, and they both built a house. One man built a house on a rock, and when the storms of life blew against that house, it stood the final judgment because it was founded upon a rock. Jesus says that's like the man that hears the truth and does something with it. There's another man that builds a house, but this man builds his house on the sand. He's the man without the eye patch. And when the storms of life come and the final judgment happens, the Bible says that that house falls to ruins. And such is the man that hears the truth, but doesn't appropriate it into his life. So here's the question this morning, and we're finished. Are my loins girded with truth? That's a little bit weird of a question, isn't it? Uh, let's, let's ask it a different, different way. Have I accepted the truth? And am I constantly accepting the truth into my life and allowing it to change me more into the image of God. I, I could ask questions like this. Do I promote the truth? Am I constantly making a search and inquiry into the truth, wanting to discover the truth? Do I welcome the truth, be it from my parents, be it from my pastor, be it from a, 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 a just a, a, an elder saint, inside of the church or, or some other good godly influence in my life? Am I, am I accepting? Am I welcoming of that truth? A am I prepared to be successful in the spiritual fight? Not that I'll face next year, next month, or next week, but this week. Because, because I've, I've put on the build of truth and I'm ready for whatever may come my way because I know and have confidence that the truth of God's Word will make me free in no matter whatever scenario I may face. Truth makes us free. And so the exact opposite of that would be that the absence of truth enslaves us and eventually will cause us to be destroyed. Let's stand this morning for prayer.